The Rebel Capitalist Show. All right, guys, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to bring someone back to the Rebel Capitalist Show. He is my good Ooh. friend and fellow capitalist. He's, I would say he's a rebel capitalist, but he is very well known as the nomad capitalist. Andrew Henderson, welcome back to the show. Oh, it's always good to be here. <laughs> All right, so we were just talking offline about Colombia. You're someone who's very, very yeah. familiar with this area, uh, not just Bogota, but Medellin, where I am right now. And uh, let's start there. Let's go into some international real estate. Uh, that's something I've been yeah. doing down here since 2015. But uh, kind of what's on your radar right now as far as international real estate? Uh, what about Turkey? Yeah. That's something that I'm kind of uh, intrigued by. Yeah. Well, I saw your place in Medellin that's for sale, and I have to, I'll give an endorsement. That is one of the best looking places that I've seen turnkey in Colombia with a decent yield. Uh, as people know, there's a lot of sharks down there in those waters. So to work with someone like yourself, I think is good. I do like Colombia, but there's some bureaucracy, as you know. So if you're not going to be down there, um, it can be a little bit more to, uh, to handle. Um, you know, I'm still, after a decade, I'm a fan of Cambodia, a little bit harder to get into. I have a good friend who runs a, a, a fund there of, of properties and has done very well with it. Um, Turkey is interesting. You know, I had Jim Rogers on uh, yeah. a while back. Jim Rogers says Turkey is uh, falling apart. And that's what I like to see when I want to invest. And so you have the Lira in bad shape. I have a property in Istanbul that I got as kind of an R&D test. And uh, the appraisal is pretty much kept up with the dollar. So people think the property is worth half, you know, in a good neighborhood like in Ashantashi. You're going to have so much diaspora, so much high net worth, you're not going to really see that. And so that's been the case. That's the case in a lot of markets. So I think Turkey is very interesting, whether you wanted the citizenship deal and get a free citizenship, uh, whether you want to uh, do fix and flips, maybe outside of Nishantashi, like in an Osman Bay, Belmonte area, somewhere in Istanbul. I think there's uh, some potential for someone like you to do that. The only challenge is for someone like you is you then can't flip those to a CBI investor uh, for the citizenship, because unless you become a Turk yourself. So there's yeah. some restrictions on that. Turkey is interesting. Georgia, perhaps, I still think, uh, you know, had some issues and, and maybe now back on track. Um, but, you know, a lot of stuff's overpriced in the world right now. So those are four that I, I stick with. There's a lot of places that aren't worth it. How's Montenegro right now? Montenegro is great. I mean, I own property on land. I own other stuff in Montenegro. I mean, Montenegro was shot up. Um, Montenegro is on the euro, which I suppose is a little bit cheaper now than it was a little bit before. But Montenegro to me was always a lifestyle destination. It's hard to get a really solid yield there right. um, because you have a seasonal business by and large. So we do have people who are moving to Serbia, moving to Montenegro, because they're saying these places are far more open than a lot of other parts of the world. Um, but, you know, as an investment, I think it's more of a lifestyle investment. Yeah. So from Albania, by the way, Albania is the place. And I've had for years been talking to guys, big hotel guys. This is the last untouched place in Europe for beach. Um, I think Saranda in the south is a lot stronger. Valora in the middle is okay. The north, I would stay away from. Um, so I think if you want to be down by the Greek border, there could be some potential. I mean, $500 a meter, you're right across from the sea. There's potential. But as with all these markets, Turkey too, you really got to know what to avoid. There's a lot of scams. So you need to know people oh, yeah. going in. What, uh, let me ask you, what, what about Azerbaijan? You know, I'm, <laughs> despite the interest in Turkey, I, I am on Team Armenia. I've been to Baku. It seems like a watered down version of Istanbul. I, I have to be honest with so many people on our team in Armenia. I have, I have, that's been the one side that I've taken. Um, Azerbaijan was never, it was always the most expensive, I think, of that market. Um, I mean, I, I guess unless you want to deal with incompetent banks that don't care how you felt the forms, uh, I don't see Azerbaijan as being that interesting. Okay, so when you're talking about red flags, I mean, this is something that I tell gringos who hit me up all the time, you know, wanting to come down and invest in Colombia. Uh, they see maybe a return I've made on a flip or mm -hmm. uh, a rental yield or something like that. They say, oh, I want to come down and do this. And I always warn them. I say, listen, you have to know what you're doing. Uh, if you know what you're doing, there's huge, huge opportunity because of the inefficiencies in the market. If you don't know what you're doing, there's a 99% chance that you lose money. So let's try to help some people here. What are the, the top maybe three red flags uh, that you tell your viewers and listeners and subscribers to, to look out for yeah. when you're going to in looking at international real estate? 
was just having a, a chat with a client this morning. You know, we help people do this. Uh, and obviously our focus is largely on the immigration side, on the plan B, on the financial side, putting it all together. Maybe you move somewhere, lower your taxes. But yeah, when it comes to buying a property, I said, hey, there's no MLS. And so, I mean, you don't want to buy property online. People have a hard time understanding that when they leave the US, Canada, Australia, I think they just go online, fire up some machine, call some, some broker who, you know, it's like when you go to these countries where they don't speak English and you see an ad that's in English and it takes you a while to realize, like, that's not supposed to be that way. This country doesn't speak English. Like, why is that in English? Uh, it's, but it seems natural to you for a while, right? Because you speak English and you're like, oh, yeah, look at that ad in English. Um, and so I think people will be just like, oh, this is the MLS. Some of these websites in Turkey, I mean, total scams. Um, and if you're looking for property online, I think it's a problem. You need to come and you need to pound the pavement or you need to have someone who's pounding the pavement for you. Um, another thing, perhaps that's an issue you would know as well as I do in Colombia, you know, people who are selling properties in dollars, for example, you know, market like a Georgia or a Cambodia, you'll see property in dollars, Montenegro, the euro is the currency, Ecuador, the euro is the currency, Panama, the dollar, or sorry, the dollar in Ecuador, the dollar in Panama. Um, but if you're in Colombia, or if you're in, you know, some other market, but that's not how they price, you want to be careful of that. Um, so that's a concern. Um, you know, I, I sometimes think working with the gringo providers is a red flag. Um, again, people want to feel comfortable. I've, I've had some negative experiences with those guys, not necessarily buying stuff that didn't work out well, but just other negative experiences, especially in Latin America, where I think it's sometimes better to work with trusted, high quality local people rather than someone who is selling something to gringos. I get all the emails. I'm sure you get all the emails from all these, you know, retire overseas people. They have a slice of paradise somewhere. I mean, I, I just think that those deals in many cases are overpriced and uh, I would avoid it in many cases. How do you try to find someone good locally if you're a foreigner? Uh, trial and error. You build a network. One thing I've, all, I've always said was, you know, having good attorneys and building on that network works. I mean, part of why I do what I do, and I'm sure you're the same, is you know, when you buy properties, when you do deals, you find people. I have probably the best renovation guy because I'm constantly doing renovations, as are you. Um, the best guys in Colombia, super detail oriented, super responsive, great after service. Uh, he knows other people who are good. And so you plug into his network. And so it's a multiplier effect. But I think a good place to start is a good lawyer, good accountant. Um, again, is the lawyer, the gringo lawyer who you know, does stuff on the cheap for a cheaper gringo audience. Is that going to be the best person? Not necessarily. I mean, I'll often try and find the guy in Mexico City who's $500 an hour because he's probably going to have better connections, uh, especially at a high level. So uh, I think that, you know, the multiplier effect of networking, uh, especially with locals, is valuable. Yeah, and it, it is definitely a trial and error process. That's uh, part of the risk, of, but that's also part of the opportunity that if you do find that network, and those people that you can trust that are good, that gives you a massive edge uh, over the market. When's the last time you were in Medellin? It's been a while since I've been. I was in Cali uh, over Thanksgiving, and right. Cali's a very interesting place. I don't see Cali as having, I mean, it's not as developed as Medellin. Uh, it's certainly not as developed as a Bogota. It's, it's different. They have their own kind of way of living down there by their own admission. Um, so I don't, I never got quite the hype of Kali when I dug into the numbers, but it's been a while since I'm, I'm going to come down and see you. What have you, were you here, uh, when they had built the click clack hotel down by Park Yaris and Provenza? I think, I think so. Cause it's in Bogota also. I remember seeing that. Yeah. yeah they do have one in Bogota. They're a lot different, uh, but yeah, the same, same group. Yeah. I was just yeah. wondering what your impression of that area is, or just down by the Charlie um, you know, the, a lot of that really? money is moving from Parqueiras up towards uh, Provenza, you know, and they, they've made a lot of changes here since I was here last, and that would have been maybe a year and a half ago. So I don't know if you've been here more recently, but I was just wondering what your impressions were of that area and maybe the changes. I haven't been there in the last, it would have been 2019, I guess. Uh, so it's been a couple of years, end of 2019, I think. Uh so I think you're the expert in that, but certainly in me, I mean, Park Yaris, I mean, there's kind of a, you know, I, I never know that I've entirely gelled with that area. I mean, my challenge in that part of town, I mean, Pavlato, for example, was you have so many restrictions on some of those places. And, and again, you would know better than I do, but you have all these tourists who come and create problems in buildings with families. And so I know there are guys who just built 
you know, all Airbnb, all kind of short term uh, buildings to kind of get around that issue. But, um, you know, for me, some of the areas that were outwards, you're saying it's Provenza, it's Envigado, always seemed interesting as something kind of up and coming. I think you've got to choose what you want to do. So if I'm going to Istanbul and I'm getting into a neighborhood or I'm getting into a deal where I just wanted to hold its value, get a citizenship, just pay some fees and, and get that uh, plan B. Uh, I probably want to put my money in the, the established neighborhood where everybody, where Dr. Oz is coming and putting his money when he buys. Uh, if I want to make a return, I would imagine that, you know, what you're doing is you're, you're kind of going to be in the cutting edge a little bit more. Um, and so I don't know that, you know, that area would be where I would be in Park Terrace. Yeah, I, I go there because um, I know the area well. I mean, I know every yeah. street, almost every building, like the back of my hand. And uh, I know what the comps are. I know what the rents are. Well, it's uh, valuable. Yeah, it, it's extremely valuable. Um, how I, I know, I think you focus a little bit more on Bogota, don't you? Well, I have people who go to Medellin. We have a lot of people in Medellin that we work with. Um, you know, personally, for me, Bogota, number one, I enjoy the fall weather. I'm getting more fall weather in my diet these days, but I, that was kind of my first fall weather place. I think yeah. for someone who travels internationally a lot, it's a little bit more convenient. Um, you know, you have more of the diplomatic stuff there if you're getting visas or dealing with that kind of nonsense. So for those reasons, I, I kind of liked it. People seem to, there's almost this kind of thing among some people in Bogota where it's like, oh, we're not the Pisces, like, you know, we know we're not quite good enough. Like, I, I kind of like coming from Ohio, I like a little bit of humility, you know, which people <laughs> elsewhere say the, the, the Rolos in Bogota don't have, but uh, I've picked up on some of it, actually. All right. So for someone who's interested, uh, maybe in, in international real estate, maybe it's Cambodia, maybe it's Turkey, maybe it's yeah. Colombia, what type of yields could they expect? You're just talking about a rental property, like a buy and hold rental property. And what would be maybe some of the downsides and maybe some of the upsides compared to investing in the United States? Well, I, well, from my perspective, I mean, the upsides are in many countries, including in Colombia, uh, you can get a residence permit, you can get a citizenship, you can work towards citizenship. I mean, for me right now, with everything going on in the world, most people probably don't want to do so at the level that I'm doing. Um, but, you know, I'm working on a sixth citizenship. At some point, I'm going to kind of stop. I have a couple of residence permits on top of that. <laughs> I think having diversification, that if you're traveling, if you want to go someplace, if you need a place, let's say you're in crypto and you have a hard time, you know, you're, they don't want your U.S. passport. I want to have as many options as possible. And so real estate, you know, you go to Colombia, sub $200,000, you get permanent residence and you're on your way. Many countries in Latin America do that. Um, Cambodia doesn't, but many countries here in Eastern yeah, Europe Andrew, do. So to me, I hate to cut you out there, but just I want to insert real quick for the viewers. Yeah. And I don't know if you know this, but that's how I got into Columbia without having to have the, we'll call it the medicine uh, to keep it YouTube friendly is because well, I yeah, had because that people, investor visa. That's correct. And so people were saying, oh, Columbia, it's over. It was, it was kind of in the same pace as Mexico, where it was, it was Colombia, the DR, Mexico, and I think Costa Rica, and now Norway's on the list. Um, it was just wide open. You don't need anything. And then they changed it. And like, no, 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 it's for tourists. So if you're a citizen and I, yeah. And as a, if you're a permanent resident or maybe just even a resident, I think also, um, then you're right. exempt from those rules. Yeah, all they do is they ask you for your cedula. If you got your cedula at the airport, right. then the only thing you need is a negative test. Which, it, which it's nice, by the way, that they usually don't want to see the cedula. They're like, no, no, no. Where's the visa? Where's the visa? The cedula is only for inside. Now that they want to see the cedula, it's very, it's like a nice turn, a nice twist. But, um, I think that's the reason, quite frankly, I mean, um, and now look at what's happening in Canada. I want to have options. Yeah. Um, and probably Colombia, for all everyone who says, oh, the taxes are high. The tax system is relatively straightforward. It's not like a European tax system. I mean, you can spend a good amount of time there. And it's a very kind of cut and dry tax system before you know you've got to pay taxes. By the way, some of the lowest taxes overall in the OECD when you add it all up. But um, you know, yields have certainly been, been scrunched. I think your deal is an incredible yield for what it is for turnkey. Uh, in Asia, you generally see a little bit lower yields. I think that my friend generally gets, and, and I get, you know, six, 7% distributions. Um, oh, now yeah. he's managing that. So maybe it's a little bit higher on your own, That's but Cambodia, in Asia, you Andrew. kind of need someone to run it. What's that? Cambodia. That's in Cambodia. I mean, you're getting a dollarized six and a half, seven 7%. That includes someone managing it. 
Um, you know, in a turkey, I think you could probably get close to what you're doing, you know, nine, nine percent, something like that. Um, but the challenge is you're not going to get it in these best areas. So people need to know what they're getting into. Do you want great yield or do you want um, uh, do you want something that's, you know, beautiful, you would move into yourself. So, you know, if you're going to buy an Ashantashi in Turkey, you're probably getting 4% because um, it's just how it's going to work. So I think if you're doing stuff that maybe isn't quite as livable as you would like, you can be close to 10% still, but certainly those have gotten squished. As you see people who, who have capital they want to deploy, Asia, again, kind of a prime place for that. Uh, maybe Georgia, not as much of a place for that. Maybe it's still 7 8% in dollars. Uh, but Columbia, I think, has been one of the better yield places. The reason that fewer people that I work with do it is because they just don't want to be down there to deal with the bureaucracy. In Georgia, for example, even in Turkey, you set it and forget it to pay your, you know, pay everything. In Colombia, as we were discussing beforehand, there's a bit more uh, going on there, a little bit more bureaucracy. Um, how much debt is, uh, let me rephrase that, what percentage of property owners in a Cambodia or a Turkey have mortgages. Have you looked into that? I don't know the exact number. I think in Cambodia, it's a very small number. I think in yeah. Turkey, it's certainly, I mean, it's more of a developed banking market. Yeah, in so Columbia, you have it's, able... it's maybe like 10 or 15%. It's incredibly low. Yeah, I think in some places like it, especially emerging countries, it's going to be very low. Uh, you're seeing a rise, let's just take Georgia, for example, great rise in consumer debt. I They're even seem to be now doing debt for non-residents. I had someone the other day say he's getting a 70% LTV loan uh, from the bank on a on a secondhand purchase. So it's not even some of some endorsed developer that they have a deal with. Um, but yeah, I mean, to me, that's a very beneficial thing. It keeps prices somewhat low, but um, I think you'll see more consumer debt coming into some of these markets as they develop. But I would imagine it's probably a similar number in a place like Cambodia and probably higher um, in a place like Turkey. Yeah, I like it because I think that's actually a uh... It can be a pro and a con. It, it's a con in the sense that there's less liquidity. Uh, you're not going to sell a property in four hours like you do in Correct. the United States. Uh, the benefit is I think it really limits your downside because if very few people have a mortgage payment, it's tough to have a, a, a GFC, yeah. you know, where, where housing prices go down by 50% in nominal terms from 2006 to 2012. It's very, very difficult for that to happen. So um, and I like to point that out because a lot of people, especially from the West, they, they don't yep. even, they're so accustomed to just everyone having a mortgage that they've never really even thought about what would happen if a real estate market, if very few people had mortgages. This is to me the biggest thing right now. And, you know, I'm putting out the word, go where you're treated best. There are 252 territories and countries in the world, if you exclude Antarctica. Um, the idea that yours or the ones that are similar to yours. So let's say you're a Canadian and saying, oh my God, I got to get out of here. Let me go to Florida. Uh, let me go to the UK. Let me go to Australia. Let me go somewhere like that. If you get out of that bubble, you're going to find that what you know of the world is probably dramatically different everywhere else. And so the idea that, oh, well, it's just until this happens or it's just until that happens. Well, nowhere is perfect. But as you, as you point out, I mean, the odds for something catastrophic to happen are, are much stronger. So, I mean, I'm buying stuff that either there's a strong demand to resell, which is what you're doing, um, or that I just want to own until the end of time. And so, you know, if I look at a 20 year time horizon for Turkey, uh, do I think Turkey is going to be a stronger player or a weaker player? I think it's going to be stronger. And in the meantime, if you want a passport from a country that's uncorrelated with the West and it's agitating the West to a certain degree, it's kind of a, a complementary addition to your portfolio of passports, you can do that as well. So that's what interests me in that. What's, can you outline what the current passport program is in Turkey? Because I think it's pretty attractive, isn't it? So they made some changes for 2022, but the deal in Turkey is you need to buy the Turkish lira equivalent of 250,000 US dollars in real estate. And so there's a few things you need to satisfy there, but it has to be an appraisal. So if you spend 250 on a resale, it might appraise at 235, for example, especially if there's not as many comps. So you probably are gonna to wanna to spend if you're buying a resale above. If you're buying in you know, a new condo building, obviously you have plenty of comps unless you're the first guy buying, but I mean, those are often dramatically overpriced. Um, there's a lot of scams and schemes going on out there. So the resale market is incredibly tight, um, but if you can get it appraised at 250, and then you can keep it to that number, you know, by the time you, you get your conformity certificate, you know, a couple of days later, um, then it's 250. You hold it for three days or for three years. They put a title deed restriction on it. So you, you physically can't sell it. Right. Um, but during that 
time. You're free to rent it. You're free to use it. You can do whatever you want with it. Um, and again, if you buy correctly, you could have decent um, hold values in U.S. dollars, even if the lira goes down. Uh, you can also put half a million dollars in the bank. You have to do that now in lira. So whatever the number is at the time of the deposit opening, they did put in a condition that if you lose more on the value of the lira dropping than the interest rate, the central bank is going to reimburse you. So if interest rates are 15% and the lira goes down 20 against the dollar, they will give you the five. If you mm. uh, want to put your faith in that, that's also a three-year hold. Bonds are a three-year hold, or you can hire 50 people. Probably not worth it. Better deals for that elsewhere. But for most people, buying out an apartment, 250. What type of visa-free travel does that passport have? So a Turkish passport is, is very complimentary. Let's say a Caribbean passport where they're very strong. It's what I call a T or C plus. No U.S. access, no European Union access or U.K., uh, but a lot of other places. So every single country in the Americas, I think with the exception of Guyana. Um, so from Mexico, which is an e-visa, it's a little bit more hit or miss, but everything you know, on down. You've got access to all of Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, you've got access to all of Eastern Europe. So here where I'm at right now in the Balkans, you've got those all covered. You don't always get those with many passports that you can obtain. Um, Central Asia, Japan, which is a hard country to get actually, if you're not American or if you don't want to be American anymore, or if you're, you know, you're on some, some lesser passport, Japan, Korea, Southeast Asia, again, very well covered. Most countries that aren't Western countries don't go, can't go to Thailand. And then you get a few countries that again, are, are kind of, um, unless you're an American or a European, hard to get Morocco, Paraguay, Brunei, um, a couple of weird ones. So it's very strong Russia e-visa. Um, so it's very strong if you don't want to go to the West or you have a European residence permit or you're getting Caribbean citizenship or if you've already got a good passport and you plan to keep it and use this only as a backup. Right, right. Makes sense. I wanted I've got this written down because I wanted to get your thoughts on this. I saw the other day that uh, I think Wynn is building a 1000 room casino in the UAE. Uh, I think it's going to be built by maybe 2025, something like that. Mm -hmm. And so, and I know I've talked to my good friend, Chris McIntosh, who's a hedge fund manager. He does uh, yeah. focus on global macro, and he's been interested in that area for quite some time, uh, especially because of uh, the commodity prices. I, I won't go into shortages and whatnot, but he's really had his eye. He thinks that they're opening up. He says, he'll be the first person to admit that it's nowhere near as free as the United States. That's not the claim claim is they're going in the right direction. So uh, did you hear that news about the Wynn Casino there and them kind of opening up and becoming more liberal? And what are your thoughts? Well, they have been doing that. I did not hear that particular news. I mean, I've always been a big fan of Steve Wynn. I know he's no longer there, but uh, I think that there is movement in the right direction. Um, I mean, there are some challenges, but for me, what's great about the UAE, for example, is um, you have a company Free zone companies, despite the recent news, should still be 0% tax under most conditions. And so you can go and you can bring your staff from all around the world. There aren't that many places where you can bring people from pretty much anywhere on earth and have them all work under one roof, uh, if that's what you want to be doing. From the investment side, yeah, I mean, they were one of the uh, the people or the countries moving in the right direction this year. We saw a lot of countries uh, on the Heritage Foundation Index, even uh, Singapore went down. Of course, all the Western countries went down. That's before what we're seeing in Canada right now. Uh, so the UAE was moving in the right direction along with Barbados and others. I, I think it's very interesting. Um, and so I think that region is interesting. Bahrain is perhaps one of the most open ones and they've got an interesting real estate investor visa program and they just opened up a golden visa program. So I always like seeing countries open up. I mean, the UK uh, just shut down their investor visa program, 82% non-Russian applicants, non-Russian approvals. They don't want Russian money, so they just throw the whole baby out with the bathwater. I guess they figure they can do that. Um, but to me, that's kind of a step in the wrong direction, whereas the UAE doing that, yeah, step in the right direction. I count all steps in the right direction. Yeah. I think that's good, whether it's the place to live or not. Yeah, so now let's talk about steps, steps in the wrong direction. And I know I listened to your podcast. It's fantastic. Everyone's got to check it out. It's just Nomad Capitalist. And you really have your finger on the pulse of what's happening with the um, kind of tax narrative in the United mm. States yeah, yeah, and how we really see that changing in areas, not just in California, but at a federal level. So uh, what's going on with, with tax? And I think even most Americans don't realize 
what's happening there as far as how the, the tides are kind of changing and how this view towards taxing the rich is becoming more and more and more popular. Well, define the rich, by the way. I mean, yeah, right. your, your stomping grounds, mild stomping grounds in Arizona, if you make $250,000 now, would they almost doubled your state income tax? Um, $250,000 in this environment is the evil rich. I mean, you got to be kidding me. But, uh, you know, I, I repeat a phrase from a friend of mine who lives here in Eastern Europe. He says, I never look in someone else's pocket. There are certain places where that, I think, is still the case. Um, but, you know, I follow Bernie Sanders. Every post is how uh, people are being left behind. And yet Bernie Sanders doesn't consider the fact that, you know, my example, I'm going to be in Malaysia when they uh, reopen. Um I mean, look at Malaysia in 1990. Go, go back and look at pictures. It was uh, a real mess. Look at Singapore before yeah. that. Look at South Korea and look at them now. Those people are now employing people. I mean, I've stumbled upon Eastern Europe. We have three offices that we're, we're about ready to move into. You're in Colombia. Would you have hired in Colombia in 1985? Yeah, no, but the narrative is there must be something wrong with these people who aren't doing everything Bernie Sanders wants. People are having to be competitive. You can't just, you know, graduate from high school with a C minus average and go and work at a factory and make sixty thousand dollars a year. Back when sixty thousand dollars was even more money, and so people are upset and they're angry. And imagine that your audience and my audience doesn't even understand the realities of how real estate and all this stuff works. Passports, right? What's the average person? What's the average voter thinking? All they know is they're scared. The country has changed. There aren't as many opportunities, and they want to punish someone because they want their stuff combined with this kind of younger entitlement mentality of everything's a human right, cancel rent, cancel mortgages, cancel everything. I don't think you turn that ship around until you hit the iceberg first. I think that the countries that have hit the iceberg are the places where you get out, whether it's finances or whether it's freedom. Um, they're like, yeah, we're not going to go back to that. But the U.S. has is, is um, you know, I used to call it the Paris Hilton of countries. I mean... How do you convince someone who just has always had money for the taking and never remembers why it's there? Because it was so far back. How do you change that yeah. until you hit rock bottom? And talk about this yeah. push towards a not just a wealth tax, yeah. but even more insanely, a uh, unrealized cap gains tax. There's so many of these. I don't know how many times California has brought back another wealth tax proposal. One of the things that I'd be concerned about, by the way, is retroactive taxes. Look at what happened. By the way, not under Biden, not under Obama, but under Trump, a retroactive tax that went back three decades and said, you know what? <laughs> yeah, we actually do want you to pay on that. Um, so I don't think it matters who's in power. But yeah, wealth taxes. Um, California wants that. Uh I guess Elizabeth Warren wants that. The numbers always come down. In the UK, they were talking about half a million pounds they wanted to do it. In South Africa, they were talking about 7% a year, as high as that. I saw one other country, I forget where, that wanted a one-time 20% wealth tax. So they're getting pretty egregious. I mean, just even if you scale that back a lot, it's still not great. But yeah, unrealized capital gains. And I mean, you look at these companies. You, this is your space, George. Look at Peloton. Look at PayPal. Look at all these companies that were the darling uh, and I've been seeing your tweets about the Kathy Arcs of the world. I mean, look at these companies that were the darling of the pandemic, and now they're back to, to exactly where they were or below. What do you do? Do they give you all your money back? All right. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's, and by the way, the government created an environment where you couldn't go to the gym. So people said, hey, I'm going to order a Peloton. And now they're angry that those businesses expanded and hired people at a difficult time. This is my biggest frustration. I'm an employer. I have people all around the world. When COVID started, I said, listen, we're financially strong. Um, business grew. But regardless of that, we're going to keep everybody on, on the team. And I think that was the right thing to do. But then to say, well, hey, we became successful because of their stupid policies and business grew. Uh, hey, listen, don't blame me. Of course, business is trying to become more successful, but nobody wants to hear that anymore because the entrepreneurial spirit has been sucked out, unlike in places like Turkey, like India, like somebody like Colombia even. Yeah, you know, talking about taxes, it just, one thing that's in the news recently in the United States, it just shows the absolute hypocrisy of these politicians is the, and I dislike both parties equally. I'm sure, I, I think you fall right. into that, that category as well. Uh, but a lot of the, the Elizabeth Warren types, let's say, 
are wanting to reduce the gas tax uh, to give people a break. Basically, they're trying to buy votes. So these are all the people that yeah. say that if we don't do something about moving to electrification, that we're all going to be dead in 10 years. But, uh, oh, let's go ahead and pull back this gas tax. You know, it's just the, the level of hypocrisy is astonishing. And the fact that people still put their faith and confidence in these politicians never ceases to amaze me. Well, my favorite, by the way, and I was walking down kind of a side street earlier today, and I'm stepping over a couple of masks on the street. Whatever you think about that, the party that was most in favor was like, hey, we got to be for the environment. <laughs> Listen, I happen to be very much for the environment. I try and, you know, I try not to, you know, waste stuff. I'm avoiding plastics at all costs. I mean, listen, let's, you know, we don't have to be ridiculous. I don't think we have to tax people. That, Of course, everything they want to do is a tax. But hey, listen, if I could just organically have less of an impact, I'll do that. Um, but somehow that's not cool anymore, right? I mean, the thing of let's not put tons of new crap in land. No, forget that. That's that's like yesterday's cause. Yeah. So, of course, it's hypocrisy. And of course, um, uh, it's all, by the way, 62% last year of Americans paid zero federal income tax, and they'll go out and tell you that they're they're tax paying citizens, and that Elon Musk is uh, is is the devil, right. and that I'm a traitor for leaving the system. I don't worry about their taxes anymore, um, but I think other people probably should. I, I don't know how, with all of the macro environment now, your taxes can go anywhere but up. There's there's no room to do otherwise. And it's going to be on this income inequality of tax, this tax inequality, where 80% of people will pay nothing and everyone else will go back to some, uh, you know, Eisenhower level rates. Yeah. I know one of your, your big things is to have a plan B. And I don't think there's any better example of that right now than what's happening in Canada. And uh, I think for many Americans, they don't realize the draconian measures that the Canadians have had to live under for the last two years, for heaven's sakes. And now, obviously, this is coming to the head with the truckers and whatnot. But then you take it a step further, and a lot of these people are having their bank accounts actually frozen. Uh, I mean, think about those truckers, if they would have had a bank account in Mexico or even in Colombia, something like that, or even in the United yeah. States, for heaven's sakes, although that might be tied to the same system. I'm, I'm not quite sure how that would work. But um, I mean, what are your thoughts on what's happening in Canada right now from a standpoint of freedom, liberty, the truckers, and then having these bank accounts frozen? I've been a big advocate of banking all over the world. I mean, again, this is something that for R&D reasons, I've set up accounts all over the place. I just got a thing the other day, my uh, Mongolian account, I had drawn down to like 10 bucks. They're like, after five years, we're closing your account and they're keeping my seven or $10 or whatever it is. Um, and I'm like, oh, good. I thought I had to disclose that account somewhere. But um, yeah, I, I mean, people say, oh, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin fixes this. I mean, I think that, um, you know, having some fiat in bank accounts could be a thousand bucks, could be five thousand bucks. I mean, there's plenty of banks around the world that are secure and that aren't necessarily going to go along with whatever they're doing. I always encourage people. I'm the goody two shoes to offshore. I'm not telling people to go out and commit crimes and hide their money, but I think I think you know following some set of order is important. But um, yeah, I, I mean, when I, I've always said my entire life, the, who who makes the laws? Right. I mean, you think that politicians in the Western world are any better than politicians anywhere else. They want power. They don't like people fighting with them. They don't really want you to have a voice. Uh, and that's what's happening. And so, I mean, here's my fear, George, is that people now that you're seeing the pandemic wind down, at least for now, right. people are going to be lulled into a false sense of security. And everyone who is rushing to put their plan B in place to have their residence, have their passport, have their bank account somewhere else is going to suddenly say, oh, great, it's all back to normal now. As if history has shown that that, I mean, it's the exact opposite of what happened. I mean, our entire lives, they've been pulling random stuff and it's only gotten worse. Meanwhile, by the way, I mean, you know, go and deal with airport security in the US and then compare it to airport security in Malaysia. And they may say they do the same things, but they don't. Right. Compare a lockdown in Canada to a lockdown in Turkey when I was walking around ordering hamburgers on the street and watching kids play as the police watched on. I mean, there's a difference. And I think that um, the Western world is not a bastion of freedom anymore. Uh, by the way, it's not Justin Trudeau. It's not Joe Biden. There are people who want them in power. You're right. And so if you're relying on your fellow citizens to look out for your well-being, you're screwed. 
And so for the same reasons as the taxes, if you're watching Nomad Capitalist, if you're watching George Gammon, your fellow citizens probably disagree with you. And you probably want a place where people are more open to the way that you think. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And on that note, what are your top, I would say, uh, three countries right now for people who uh, think like nomad capitalists or, or rebel capitalists? I, I, I've said for some time, Eastern Europe um, is a bit of a cultural adjustment if you're coming from Canada, but I've got a lot of people who are moving here because they like, whether it's Serbia, whether it's Montenegro, Georgia was a bit more European focused. I think they've kind of backed off a lot of that. Armenia was always decent. I mean, these are countries that maybe have less Western outlooks. Um, they're countries that have seen madness. They're countries that don't want to go back there. People push back. That's been good. Nicaragua has been pretty popular. That's definitely an adjustment. You know, you, you can live on the beach down there. El Salvador obviously is attracting a lot of people in the Bitcoin community. I think, you know, Colombia is maybe relatively good. Um, but I think you want people who have seen something before, people who aren't afraid, people who are tough. Uh, and by the way, I'm looking, I've been listening for the last two weeks just to a peaceful protest uh, outside of where we work. And uh, nobody's getting in the way of this thing. So I don't know, which is the more democratic and free country, Serbia or Canada? Yeah. It's a question you wouldn't have asked that not that many years ago. Are, are they protesting the mandates? I don't what mandates uh, they are protesting uh, the government in general. <laughs> well, I like them already. <laughs> yeah. And now I know you talk a lot about Mexico. Uh, I think I'm going to be speaking Mexico at too. Event in, um, in what is it? September 21st at the live Nomad event. Capitalist Live, September 21st through 24th. We're looking forward to having you. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to going down there. And I get a lot of people on the comments of my YouTube videos and whatnot that ask about Mexico. And I know it's it's not just a one, it's not a monolith. So what's your view on Mexico and, and what areas uh, should people look at based on what their um, priorities are? Like I know some people, you know, they love the beach. So maybe that's uh, right. Playa de Carmen, uh, where other people, they like more of a, a metropolitan type area. Maybe that's Mexico City. Yeah. I think Puerto Vallarta has gained a lot of uh, steam recently. That seems to be a very interesting place. I'm not a big beach guy. You know, we've done conferences in Cancun, Playa del Carmen. I was in Tulum. I was greatly disappointed by Tulum, quite frankly. Playa del Carmen, I think, had some problems. That whole area has seen some problems. Um, you know, if you like a smaller environment, I think Merida is one of the safest places in Mexico. Uh, but Puerto Vallarta has been coming up. Mexico City, I think there's plenty of safe areas. I mean, I don't think you even have to be in an urban environment. Go to Lomas. For example, you've got beautiful kind of sprawling homes there. Um, you know, I did not like Guadalajara as much. I know some retirees like uh, the area down by Lake Chapala. That's become popular. Um, so you've got so many areas. San Miguel de Allende uh, is pretty popular for expats. Again, mostly older, but there's some younger people going there. So, I mean, this, the thing about Mexico is I think you're never done with Mexico, right? I mean, it's just endless. Um those are probably some of the places that stand out. Is there but uh, like it's close to the border, the U.S. border. Yeah. Do you really want to be like down driving, there waiting? Like driving to... like realistic <laughs> driving distance. I know. It, well, you remember Phoenix? You ever go down to Rocky Point? I didn't go to Rocky Point. I did drive to uh, what's there's a Nogales. I did, I did the Nogales thing once. Uh, listen, I and think Rocky if you're an American, blown up. When I was in in college, yeah, you know, no. we just go down there for spring break and everything. But it we did really have a yeah. town. It has. Uh, we did get pitched uh, hard by some of our event guys, my friends, uh, to have this conference in Cabo. And I just thought that's a little hard to get to. It could be people from all over the world. But Cabo, I guess, is becoming popular. Um, I, I don't know. I think the North is generally not as, as appealing, not as safe. Um, maybe Rocky Point or Cabo is the exception. It's kind of North. So I, yeah, I don't know that there's that many places there. My advice to anyone who's an American is if you're concerned about something going down, get a Mexican residence permit. They're a little bit less flexible. I mean, if you're coming for a conference, you're not going to have a problem, especially if you have a return ticket. If you're just coming for six months and just hoping, hey, give me that 180 day visa, they're doing that a lot less these days. They're being a lot less friendly just to come on in and live as a tourist. I would have a residence permit. You don't need to have that much money in the bank, which is another reason I would have bank accounts, by the way, because they don't want to see your crypto portfolio. Um, I would have an income or I would have some cash in the bank. 
I would get that residence permit and I would have that ability to walk or drive in and then go wherever I needed to go from there, whether that's in Mexico or somewhere else. Um, because again, look at what happened in Canada. Some people can't even get on a plane. Yeah. yeah. Right. That, that, it might should, be nice to. That should just be a warning signal to everybody. I, I mean, that you've got to start paying attention to your surroundings, your, your freedoms, your liberties, and that even in the West, at any moment, they can be taken away. I, especially in the West. I mean, you know, I, I, I was in, I think I, I told you two years ago, I left Myanmar at the last minute. I was there on a little trip, got back to Malaysia before everything closed down, wrote out, what, six weeks of, of you know, toughness indoors, and, you know, with champagne and cheese plates and what have you. <laughs> Ever since then, it's been, it's been so open. Uh, and I look at what people are dealing with in some of these places. I mean, we've helped so many Australians that can't even leave the country. And so, I mean, I'm not, go I'm going all over the world, except the U S Canada, Australia, New Zealand. I've been to the UAE. You think, Oh, they're pretty tough. Not really. Um, you know, I was in Asia. They've got more, more practices and more things they want you to do, but I can't say it was terrible. And by the way, in some of these places that aren't the U.S. or Canada, there's always that guy who's like, oh, we kept our restaurant open for takeout, right? Um, so I think that people don't really understand the difference between the Western countries and just how much you have seen change in the last 30 years, little in the last three years in some of these non-Western countries. There really is no comparison. Yeah. All right, buddy. You, so you won't believe it until you do it, George, and you're doing it, so. Yeah, I always tell people that uh, even if you don't want to make or you don't, you shouldn't make a commitment right away. Just travel for heaven's yeah. sake. Your next vacation, just shoot down to Medellin or Bogota or shoot down to Mexico City or just, uh, you know, put a list together. And for your next couple vacations, just go check those places out. You may hate them, but you may really, really like them. And it may open up your eyes to opportunities that you didn't realize exist. And, and, and yeah, no matter what you and I tell somebody, uh, I mean, I, I just never got the vibe of Bangkok, even in the taxi from, from the station or the airport or whatever. I, however, I got there so many years ago, the first time, just never felt, it just felt bad. doesn't mean Bangkok's a bad place for you. You need to go and check it out. And if you feel that, that sinking feeling in the taxi from the airport, then maybe that's not your place. Um, but yeah, go and check out some of these places. Look at Central and Northern South America. Look at Eastern Europe. Uh, these are some of the places that you want to see and realize that not only are there deals, not only does it operate differently, but not only can you be more free. Yeah, that's right. That's right. At the end of the day, that's what it's all about. So, Andrew, we'll go ahead and leave it there, my friend, for my viewers and listeners who want to find out more about what you do, where can they go? So it's uh, if you're on YouTube, it's Nomad Capitalist on YouTube and you can uh, find us there. Uh, it's Nomad Capitalist, the book on Amazon nomadcapitalist.com. And we do work with, um, you know, high earners, high net worth individuals who want to put together plans. You want to have a second citizenship. You want to have a residence. You want to put together the whole tax friendly, freedom friendly, lifestyle friendly plan. We do that. But the best place to start YouTube, uh, the book on Amazon, you can find it all there. And check out the podcast for heaven's sakes. You got to check out we do, podcast. We, 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 like a daily podcast. It's awesome. We put the uh, we put a lot of the stuff on the podcast as well. So so and if you, you like to listen to the podcast, there. the original Nomad, Nomad Capitalist. <laughs> the original, no, we were. I was saying, my father was saying, go where you're treated best. Back in 1996 or 1997, predicting not everything, but saying these countries are not going to be the place to be uh, at some point in your lifetime. And so prescient words. All right, buddy. Thanks All right, for George, coming on, pleasure. and we'll talk to you soon. We'll do it.